Hoş geldiniz. Şimdi Türkçe'ye direkt geçeceğim, şey, İngilizceye geçeceğim. Önce bir hoş geldiniz demek istedim. So welcome everyone. It is a great honor, a great privilege for me to introduce Professor Şehzat Beşir today. Um, as as our speaker at the Nafi Baba Center, of course. Um, so let me, uh, without further ado, uh, give a very uh, truncated uh, bio of uh, Professor Bashir. Uh, Shahzad Bashir was born in Pakistan, educated at Amherst College and Yale University. He taught for many years uh, as professor of religious studies at Stanford University. And he's currently Aga Khan Professor of Islamic Humanities and Professor of History and Religious Studies at Brown University, where I believe he's joining us from today. Um, it is impossible for me to do uh, uh, proper justice to Professor Bashir's many accomplishments. Um, so you know, I will uh, uh, just say he is one of the most prolific and one of the most creative uh, scholars of Sufism and uh, Islam, both Islamic history and Islamic studies uh, today. His most recent monograph, A New Vision for Islamic Pasts and Futures, published by MIT Press in 2022, uh, very broke new ground, uh, both in form and content. And maybe if we can manage, we can later share the link uh, in, in chat. Uh, maybe Fatih, you could do that uh, uh, later. Um, this book is an interactive, I'll quote directly, uh, uh, you know, from the website, it is an interactive open access born digital, I like this uh, phrase, a born digital book uh, that I would strongly urge everyone here to look into if you have not already done so. Instead of mimicking the uh, the form of the printed book, <laughs> uh, A New Vision for Islamic Pasts and Futures explores the seemingly infinite possibilities the digital platform uh, offers to authors and readers alike uh, today. The book is also groundbreaking uh, uh, in its uh, content, uh, offering a, a truly expansive, geographically and socially inclusive uh, view of Islam uh, through its uh, 14 centuries of, of history. So um, I will, uh, I don't want to take uh, uh, too much uh, of your time, so I will simply list uh, uh, other major publications of Bashir, hoping I'm not omitting uh, any uh, any any one of them obviously omitting all the articles and and and, and uh, just focusing on the uh, on the monographs I'll just you know go in, in a reverse chronological order starting uh, uh, from the most recent after this uh, this first book that I this most recent book that I mentioned so they are the market for poetry in the Persian world uh, published in 2021. Sufi Bodies, Religion and Society in Medieval Islam, published in 2011. Fazlallah Astarabadi and the Hurufis, published in 2005. Uh, uh, Messianic Hopes and Mystical Visions, the Nur Bahshiye between Medieval and Modern Islam, published in 2003. So, um, um, Bashir uh, is uh, currently working on a cultural history of India focused on epistemology during the period 1780, 1850. So he's moved uh, closer to our own time with this uh, a new uh, project. And uh, it is about this most recent project that I believe he will be uh, talking to us today. Um, so uh, please, uh, Professor Bashir, the floor is uh, yours. And thank you once again for um, accepting our invitation and joining us here. Well, thank you very much, Professor Taizialu, for this um, wonderful and very generous introduction. It's, it's, um, and thank you to the Nafi Baba Center for this opportunity to um, present something that I'm working on now. So um, looking to the future, so I look forward very much to um, your reactions and questions, etc. This is work that is very much in progress um, and opportunities like this to have um, a, a truly kind of international audience 
to talk about them uh, are rare, especially in the in in, in the post COVID world. So uh, it really is um, my great pleasure to be here. I'm going to start sharing my uh, screen um, to. Um, uh, okay, so I hope you can see the screen. Um, so this is a this is a project um, and that uh, uh, that Dering mentioned that I'm just starting now or have been working for a while, and so I'm working through various types of materials to um, think through questions. And um, one of the questions that is interesting for me is the question of thinking about universality and how to um, to how to try to understand worlds that that. Uh, that we that we live in today, but which are, which have been filtered through European systems, intellectual systems entirely because of the type of work we do. So I'm interested in trying to get to the, uh, a period when the Europeans are actually part of the world, but they are not so dominant. They are not hegemonic. So that's my interest in going to the 19th century into in the early colonial period. Um, and this this project evolved out of some things that I found while working on the previous book, but then has kind of taken a life of its own. Um, so <clears throat> I'm interested in the question of the history of knowledge and, and trying to um, come to the early colonial history of, of India, basically between approximately 1780 to 1850, by thinking about the problem of, um, of knowledge and epistemology. Um, so the period 1780 to 1850 is the period of the dominance of the East India Company before the crown takeover of the Indian colonies. And it is uh, important because it's the period of the uh, expansion of the territorial empire of the East India Company. So until 1780 or so, even though the company actually controlled a lot of territory, it's more or less uh, a trading company, but from 1780 onwards, its trading privileges are actually taken down and it becomes much, much more a, a governing um, agency um, in various parts of India and then expands very rapidly. So I'm interested in what happens to questions of knowledge in this period. Um, so they are politically dominant, but they're not actually not dominant in, in questions of knowledge at all at this time. Uh, so one of the things that I found somewhat to my surprise is there's an immense amount of material that is produced in non-European languages in this period, often by people who are actually working for the East India Company. So they are really just tens and hundreds of different things that are produced uh, in Persian, in Hindustani, in Bengali, in all many different Indian languages um, that are under the political ages of the East India Company or its clients, various Indian states. Um, <clears throat> And the interesting thing about this material is that they are actually processing European information and European knowledge. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's, it's a world, and when we look at the, the, the materials in which Europe is not something that, that actually that is that alien, but the, the, the way things are framed and, and expressed is harking back to earlier patterns of genres and so on. Um, and together with this, we have the production of a lot of material culture, including painting, um, as well as architecture. And I'm interested in correlating be between these, all this material to write a cultural history. Um, now, ultimately, what I want to get from this work, which is um, kind of the broader project, is to try to make a different claim regarding modern history than what we are told today. So when we tell the history of modern history, as a project in the world today, it's tied to um, certain patterns in the Enlightenment and then transformation into professional history in the 19th century by von Ranke and other places in Germany, as well as in England, France, et cetera. So there, there's a way in which all modern history is told as if its roots go back to European ideas. And um, what I find is that this can actually be challenged. Um, if we uh, look at what is happening to history in particular uh, in non-European materials and the, the narratives about history that we find in, in the non-European materials are actually um, richer than what is in Europe because they're processing Europe, but they also are bringing together all kinds of different ideas about history that are coming from specific contexts. I think um, Ottoman history in the 19th century actually works and has a very similar type of flavor, at least to, to my understanding. But this world of this intense discussion about 
uh, about history in a modern context, including Europe, kind of gets uh, eclipsed uh, once uh, modern academic history is taken to be the be and all um, and end all um, of academic work, at least. So I want to kind of challenge the, the genealogy and my, by challenging the genealogy, I want to actually and try to produce new ways of thinking about history for the future. Uh, and also to expand what counts as history and, and what doesn't count in history, which is again an exclusion that comes through a certain type of European framing. And I don't have a necessary answers to this at the moment, but I'm just interested in, in expanding in many different directions through a look to the past and towards uh, with an intention towards the future. And within that, one of the questions is the relation between and the university and the particular. Uh, so in historical understanding, historical explanation uh, that is most dominant to our present, the relation between the university and particular is done, um, is posited via certain European philosophical ideas. And what I find is that in the non-European materials, there are other ways of processing difference and how to think about difference um, within um, a framing that has some kind of a unification. How to produce universal arguments on the basis of particulars in ways other than what a European um, human sciences actually uh, create the frameworks for in the 19th century. So that's the, the broad project. Now, um, um, um, so one of the things to do is to just to then just process immense amounts of material. So when one goes to looking for these things, uh, so I'm just I'm just listed here uh, a number of major works written and in only one language. This is all in Persian, um, produced between 1768 and 1863. These are works that go into thousands of pages. They are all sitting mostly at the British Library in London. Um, these were collected by British officials um, in the early 19th century and then gradually make, made their way into the, into the British Library and also other libraries in Britain and also other places as well. So in this, um, these are materials that have been essentially been discounted for historical uh, research um, for the most part because they are, um, the people who work on periods before the 18th century uh, regard them as too contaminated with European influence. And because they're also done under the, mostly under the aegis of the East India Company. Whereas people who work on the 19th century um, refer to early 19th century materials only when they're feeding directly into what comes about in the later 19th century in the period of high imperialism. So there's an interstice in the middle here. Um, and I was certainly surprised by the amount of material that is available. Um, and so, what I will talk about today is actually only just one of these works. And with the hope that it, it will give you a sense of the type of material this is, and also the extent of, um, of the material. So this work is uh, a, a something called Yad Gauri Bahaduri um, by Bahadur Singh. It's completed in 1833. Um, and um, so I will take you through um, the table of contents, but and then focus on the question of how what how's the term Sufi and Sufism actually work within this, and what that might provide us for uh, certain types of uh, processing of society. Um, now, so this is a work that is in two thousand eighty-two pages in two volumes. Uh, it's uh, written. It's finished in um, eighteen thirty-three. Um, and what you see on the screen is um, kind of the ending part where he's giving his name, et cetera. And the work actually continues on for quite a few pages after this, um, but this is where he uh, sets out who he is. Uh, so the man's name is uh, Bahadur Singh. He's originally from the area around Delhi. He's writing in when he's in the city of Lucknow. Um, and he, um, he, gi he gives his uh, cast as Kayath, um, uh, which is a kind of a, a scribal caste um, going back, a caste that is very important for the Mughal period, but also these are people who get employed by courts and including the East India Company, etc. So he comes from a background, a family background of, uh, of this, uh, the secretarial classes um, that have tremendous amount of knowledge of various things. Um, and, and so in, 
interestingly, he does not uh, give us any sense of that there is a patron for writing this. And he actually just says that um, people will uh, regard the immense amount of work that he has done in here and they will find it useful and so on. There's a brief discussion of uh, what history is and so on and how it's collected together and, and how does uh, things about personal observation, how they go together with um, what one has to gather from other, other previous sources and so on. So it's someone quite aware of what historical methodology is. Um, and uh, then he says, this work is, uh, as you can imagine, in, in uh, 2000 pages, a lot of text, and it's all, it's pretty small text, as you can see here. Um, <clears throat> it's divided into four parts. Um, it begins with the prophets, which is the uh, kind of Islamic understanding of biblical history, beginning with Adam. Um, there are later parts of this prophet section in which um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think he's incorporating things that have arrived um, via Christian missionaries in India, uh, European Christian missionaries. So there, the history of Christianity is more expanded here uh, as compared to what one might find in earlier sources of this type uh, in which the biblical history is discussed. Um, then he gives um, seven narratives, dastans, uh, in which it is early Islamic history, the four caliphs, Shi Imams, Umayyads, Abbasid, the Ismailis, uh, rulers who were Sayyids, and the Sharifs of Mecca and Medina. So this is kind of, a, in a way, a, a kind of a sacred history, like a fixed history almost. And, and he's repeating from earlier uh, um, universal histories that are available in Persian uh, for centuries by, the, by this time. Um, then the third part um, is with, which is focused on epistemology, people of knowledge of various types. And this is what I will focus on um, in a second in, in greater detail as to what he does with this. Um, and finally, the fourth part, which is actually the longest, is the political history, um, which um, includes um, uh, basically what would already be in a universal history of this type, um, available in Persian, um, but including a very long section on the history of Europe and all European countries. Um, and then eventually the longest part, about 500 pages, is the history of India, all the way to his own uh, times, including the Isine Company, etc. cetera. Uh, <clears throat> so it, there, there's so much in this work that obviously I can't talk extensively about at the moment, um, but I will focus on this, uh, the part um, on, the, on the question of knowledge, and one thing that you will see on the screen right now is the Copernican system of uh, planets. So he, um, he, he talks about um, modern knowledges and uh, what he called new opinions, which are incorporated together with his discussion of the Hokama or philosophers. He begins with Greeks, Franks, and then talks about Indians, Iranians, et cetera. And then in the, in the Frank section, he includes um, all the scientific knowledge that is available. Uh, coming from European sources. And, and he basically, um, he, he talks about the various moons of the, of the different planets, including Jupiter, et cetera, um, and talks about um, uh, also shooting stars and, and very, so he's incorporating things that, that are coming up in European knowledge in the late 18th century. And so there is a, there, I find this interesting in part because what you have is a system of understanding or explaining knowledge that is going back to pre-European contact times, but it, it is very easily able to actually accommodate new European ideas about what the cosmos is. Uh, and, and there is no sense that somehow the change of the cosmos with respect to Cop the Copernican ideas, etc., is somehow any kind of a challenge to intellectual um, uh, intellectual kind of issues with respect to existence and being and so on. He's just saying, well, the, these are things that are coming up, up and this is what the Europeans say. Sometimes it feels like they're just making it out, but perhaps there is something to it, et cetera. It's kind of a neutral description. And actually the description of the Copernican system is much more longer than, uh, longer than the Ptolemaic one. So I think it's, it's more uh, what he accepts. Uh, now within that, <clears throat> There is this section, the fourth section in the third um, chapter, in a way, um, where he goes into this question of uh, holders of knowledge. Um, and, and in the discussion of the holders of knowledge, there's also a question of different types of knowledge in the self. Uh, so, um, so, sorry, so it's the, 
So uh, basically, holders of knowledge, um, the sheikhs, etc. <clears throat> um, and this is divided into four parts. Um, um, one is, uh, he begins with Sunnis, then Shi'is, then Iranians and others, and then eventually Indians. Um, <clears throat> so this division actually is somewhat new um, in terms of how we would find this, this kind of uh, material in, in earlier sources. So I will um, now go into a little bit in greater detail to, to talk about what he means by these um, four categories. Um, I put the page numbers uh, here to just to show you with the extent of the information that's there. So the, um, the, uh, the lar longest section is actually on Indians, whom he calls Unudan. Um, and then after that it's Sunnis and she is seven pages and Iranians and others 18 pages. <clears throat> So clearly the, the, the biggest focus actually is, is in describing um, Indians uh, and whether we call them Hindus or not is an interesting question uh, here because of the way, what he puts into this, um, into this uh, selection. But is it, and the, the focus on Indians is important because they, he's actually describing the world that he knows and uh, best in terms of his own personal experience in India in the early 19th century. Um, so um, on the Sunnis part, he basically says that um, the uh, Sufis, uh, um, the, the, the, there are people among the Sunnis who are called Sufis, um, and he presents kind of a standard um, selection of major Sufi figures going back from the ninth century onwards um, and lineages and so on. Um, coming all the way into into India, it's very very selective because it's it's not that extensive, and um, but they they are identified with a, a Sunni um, kind of madhab, but also they are described as Sunni. Um, in the Shi section, um, he talks about twelve Rishi scholars of Hadith collectors going back to Kulaini and things like this, and then ends up with the court of Avad, where he's based in, in Lucknow, which is a Shi'i state, and the king is uh, at the time is Shi'i. So he basically uh, uh, traces this arc of twelve Rishi scholars um, who are part of this uh, understanding the, of, of knowledge holders that he's providing, which is a fairly short section. Then he has a discussion, a longer one of uh, Sufis of Iran. Um, and here what we find is one is basically groups and individuals of Zoroastrian origin. So including Parsis who were um, active in India, Iran and India. He talks about Parsis who have been going back and forth, who were established at the time uh, in, uh, in the Indian domains. <clears throat> But he traces them to ancient uh, Iranian philosophers, etc. And then, curiously enough, um, he has a discussion in this section of people who are in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and so, he first he talks about Musaylama, um, this kind of prophet at the time of Muhammad himself, who was put down in, in the early Islamic history, and then jumps to Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, uh, the founder of the Wahhabis. Um, and then Bayezid Ansari, who is a major figure in early modern uh, India and, and various assorted others. So one of the interesting things about this, uh, this categorization is that you can sort of see a collapse of history going on. People are being put together on the basis of some kind of categorization that is not put in historical order or, or even geographical uh, proximity. So Iran uh, does matter as a, uh, in this, in the in the title of the section, but then uh, most of these people are people who'd be considered to be extremists or excluded somehow or the other from the Sunni category. I think that's what's, uh, to the best of my ability to see, what he's uh, trying to do as to what unites all these people that that he is talking about. Um, and then eventually um, there is the longest section on the Indians, the Hunudan. Um, now he there he talks about vast numbers of groups, um, the major um, kind of followers of major Hindu gods, Vaishnava, Shaiva, Shakta, but then includes Jains, um, uh, uh, Nanak Shahis, the followers of Guru Nanak, six of various types, and then very long sections on Bhakats, basically people who are um, Bhakti, uh, devoted uh, gurus of, of um, Bhakti persuasion, etc. And then 
you know, immense amounts of details of different parts of India and how these holy people act and what their what their um, group what their groups do and so on. <clears throat> so this is where um, we get this uh, lived context of 19th century India, um, where all kinds of different ideas are actually mixing together, which which he um, lays out in considerable detail. <clears throat> Um, here too, um, the time by itself is not necessarily the only way in which things are correlated because he is mixing things from various time periods, um, but eventually uh, the, the greatest focus is on his contemporary world. Now, um, so this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of knowledges and knowledge holders that, that, that he presents in this very extensive chapter. Now in that, one of the interesting things for me is what he does to the term Sufi. And this is why I thought this would be an interesting uh, talk for, for, uh, for your series. Um, because what, we find, what I find is that he uses the term Sufi in many different ways and has no desire or it doesn't seem like it needs to be correlated or somehow be made consistent. Um, so the four kinds of things in which the term Sufi actually appears. Um, one is what one would uh, say is that he says that there are people specifically called the Sufia. Um, he, so in the sections on Sufis, he talks about a group called the Sufis. Um, and he says, these are people who can be called a Raushan Dil, um, illuminated heart. Um, and they are seekers of great unity. And when we look at who is included in this group, uh, it's people who would be would associated with the perspectives of uh, oneness of being. Um, and but he lays out various types of scenarios of who these people are. He says that some of them believe that the material world does not exist at all. It's all just complete illusion. Um, and it's because it's all just one and therefore we are all living in a dream versus others who have materialist understandings of some kind of unity, et cetera. So the, the complex discussion of oneness of being, which is very extensive, has an extensive footprint in India by this time is kind of reflected here. And so this is one group that is uh, the Sufis for him. Um, second, um, is particularly in the in the section on the Sunnis, the, the vast group of Sunnis uh, who are identified uh, with major masters and lineages all over the world. Um, he calls um, them Sufi and ident identifies them as Sufi. Um, there is not much um, discussion of specific um, sources, uh, although clearly he's taking from um, well-known sources with respect to the history of, of Sufis. Um, the one source that appears consistently throughout this work and is kind of the major proof text that is um, invoked again and again is um, the Rumi of, and uh, the Masnavi of uh, Mevlana. Uh, so that seems to be the, the, where we find like, when he wants to say, okay, this is, I'm telling you, this is the truth, he will cite verses from the Masnavi. Uh, <clears throat> so, and uh, I, I mentioned this here because when we think of Sufis at large and the great lineages and, and masters specifically, the poetry of Rumi is kind of the, the major substrate that, that seems to be present throughout. Now, <clears throat> a third type of way he uses Sufi is that um, there, it's a type of religious personality that can be found in, among all groups. So Iranians can have Sufis, Hindus can have Sufis, um, and Jains can have Sufis. Uh, so there is a, this is a very different usage where it's been disconnected from any specific identification with a particular religion, and it becomes a, a type of religious personality. Um, and then finally, the fourth one uh, is that he identifies as Sufis as those who are particularly concerned with the relationship between inner and outer reality. So behind that obviously is the, the understanding of Zahir and Vatin, which is fundamental to a lot of Sufi thought, uh, but he takes it out of an Islamic context and, and essentially wants to call Sufis any kind of people who are interested in this traffic between the inner and the outer. Um, and here, uh, what uh, becomes interesting for thinking about historical situation and historical inter interpretation is the, that he sees these people as the ones who are concerned with crossover between cosmological and social thought. That is to say the cosmological principle of the inner, the outer, how it manifests in, in the social world. 
And this is why I find it uh, interesting to think about this in terms of management of the relationship between universality and particularity. Um, he, he, he is actually, in a way, he's um, utilizing this lost one uh, as the basis for understanding all the other peoples who are being called Sufis as well. So the base principle of, of, of Sufis is this inner outer thing, which has a social component. Um, and then all the other people who are being called Sufis are somehow being interpreted through the hermeneutic of the inner outer. Um, now, this, is, this comes out in the immense amounts of details of cases and um, different stories that he provides. And so I'm just um, kind of summarizing this based upon um, kind of having thought through, trying to understand why the stories are the way, the way they are and why they're told in the way he tells them. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of how this works and how Sufi, um, uh, Sufi kind of cosmology is working as a hermeneutic, as a social hermeneutic here. Um, and, and which is the, the question of trying to think through how, do one, how does one tell the, what is true in a world in which there is a separation between the hidden and the apparent. Is the apparent true or the hidden true and so on and so forth. And there is no satisfactory answer to this because the whole issue is that both are intertwined. This actually lands uh, us in, in major questions, major religious questions. Um, so he has a, a defense of uh, people who worship images, um, people who might be called Hindus or Jains or Buddhists. Um, and he has a poet, uh, he cites this, um, uh, this verse, he says, well, given that the Muslims actually worship the Kaaba, what is the, all the hoo-ha about uh, people who worship idols? Basically, it's the same thing. Uh, and underlying that, he has then an extensive discussion about why the, the idea that somehow the Indians are worshiping idols is actually a misunderstanding because they don't understand that, that it's a, it's not understood correctly that the image actually is a host for the presence of the divine um, and that the host arrive and the, the, the, the divine arrives there and makes him or herself available for worship. And therefore the, the complex cosmology of how exactly image worship works in Hinduism, he goes into some details about. And then that seems to be quite similar to what happens with the Kaaba and why the attention to material objects, etc. But here you can see this um, apparent hidden business coming up. So what is actually hidden inside materiality? What is worship? What is not worship? How does the hidden actually make itself available? And we have this commonality that basically all the, all the immense variety of religious systems that are available in India, they're actually working according to the same principle. And there's an equalization of um, Muslims and, and Hindus, Buddhists, um, Jains, etc. Now, um, then he says that um, when you look at the people who are called Hindus or Indians, um, their texts are of an, an immensely great variety. And he says that I'm, I've read through them all. And part of the reason they're so different among themselves is because their texts are actually different. So there's no single um, kind of in, uh, single source from which they are all deriving and the different types of works and the, the, the Vedas, the um, the, the Shastras, the Puranas, etc. He lists all of these texts. They actually have widely different uh, contents, which is what then leads to them being uh, different in the world. Um, there is still then the question, this obviously stands in some tension with the idea that there is only one real truth because the sources themselves are actually evocating very different types of truth. And he says that, well, um, the way you tell the various types of Hindus apart is by looking at what they do with their bodies, what kind of marks they have, what they wear, etc. But then again, we have this, uh, this issue of, well, then why have the external differences um, if at the end of the day, it is all coming down to a, a, uh, the same divine that is shared between all of them. Um, now, I'm, there's no um, resolution to these questions. I'm just putting the, these things out there what, as to what strikes me as uh, things that he's working with or thinking about while um, uh, adjudicating uh, these questions. Um, then we have also an interesting discussions of what, how the inner and the outer can transform themselves. So he tells a story 
where there is a famous um, king um, in Benares who is greatly devoted towards dervishes. Uh, and when he uses the word dervish, he doesn't, uh, it includes Hindus and, and Jains and Muslims, all of them together. It's not uh, specifically talking about, about Muslims. So he says some uh, imitators, uh, people who, who he then specifies as, as a group that is called Bharns in, in uh, South Asia. So they decide that they want to trick this uh, king and they arrive at his court dressed up as, as Bhagats, as, as, as uh, religious devotees. Um, and, they, and he basically lavishes all kinds of things on them. Then he finds out that they are actually pretending and they're just basically stealing from him. His reaction to that is to give them even more gifts. And eventually, and they basically, the external form that they adopt for their purposes of deception changes them internally and they actually become um, bhagats, right? So in this case, it's we're working from the outer to the inner, that it's a creation of a deception that leads to the changing of um, inner reality, um, which is a, a different kind of um, question but as compared to what we were seeing earlier about how do you tell Hindus apart based upon their external realities because the external and the internal seem changeable um, kind of around a pivot. And he talks about um, the many, there are many, many different stories. I just um, picked some of these because they seem to be, to, to me, to um, stand out in interesting ways. So he talks about a man named Sutra Shah, uh, who is, he says, is a recent figure um, who has a lot of followers at the, at the moment when he is writing. And so he says this man <clears throat> would do things like he would dress up as a, uh, as a Hindu, so he would have a kashka, which is the uh, mark on the forehead that um, Hindu de uh, devotees use, and also zonar, which in this case means the the, the Brahmin uh, sacred thread, uh, not the the Christian Jewish uh, belt thing that we might know from the Middle East. But so he dresses up in a, in basically in a in a in the form of a Hindu devotee, and then he goes to the bazaar, and then he, he buys a kebab and bread and, and he's eating meat. So people get upset and they take him to a Qazi uh, and the, who ask him, so are you a Hindu or a Muslim? And his response is, well, all of these things that I'm doing, like the food I'm eating, what I'm wearing, what is on my forehead, these are all things made of the four elements. And so there's no actual difference between them. So it, it's completely pointless for these to be treated as identity markers. And that his social critique is against these external markers that fix people uh, in, in certain ways. <clears throat> now, this is a kind of critique that we know from all kinds of different other so Sufi sources as well. Um, and it is coming from a long history, um, certainly in India, um, in figures like Kabir, et cetera, um, but is being enacted in this specific way um, by, <clears throat> by this man. And Sutrasha has a disciple by the name of Jadu, magic. Um, and the story that he tells about them, him is that he goes to Balkh, where he is dressed as a Hindu and he goes inside a mosque and the people object. They take him to a Kazi and he, and he offers to them that, well, if, if you find me a wife, um, I'll convert to Islam. And um, they, so they figure out they, there's a widow, a good looking widow, and they say they marry uh, her to him. And then technically, then now he, he says that he's converted. But immediately after that, he asks her to basically hand over her daughter from the previous marriage to him and says, I'm going to sell her into slavery. And the money that I get from it, I'm going to live, use to live a, a debauched life. So the woman immediately divorces him. And then he leaves and he goes on to Kabul, where he does similar types of other, um, other things as well. Now, so in this case, there's a, <clears throat> there's a kind of continuation of a, of a, a, a pattern, uh, which, which is said about Sutrasha as well. So there's a whole, all these people who seem uh, to be exemplary of the crossing of this boundary between the inner and the outer, challenging of it, uh, but also in a way affirming that these things actually matter in, in society. So it's, it's, it's uh, for the most part, the people who are valorized positively, they are the ones who acknowledging the inner outer difference, but then are uh, kind of 
playing with it or challenging it or, or questioning it in some way or the other. Now, um, there is a further dynamic that is built into this situation, which is that the people themselves who are doing these kinds of things may be questioning, but their practice has the constant pro is in the constant process of actually becoming normative social practice. So he says that the, at the time when he's writing, there are large numbers of people who call themselves sutra shahis. Uh, that is, the, they're devotees of this, the, this, uh, the man who was eating the kebab and while dressed up as a Hindu. And, um, and so we have this um, image also from an album painting um, of uh, this group. Now, here they, they're dressed in very particular ways and they wear certain colors and so on and so forth. So in a way, the dynamic that he's showing uh, through these stories is that there can be a challenge, but the challenge in itself gets institutionalized into some other form. And so the, and the process then keep going on. So essentially when the Sutra Shahis get institutionalized in the way we see in this painting, then someone else has to come along and actually challenges, challenge their externality in order to create an opposition to that um, and, and, and so on. And a lot of the narratives that he provides um, seem to be doing that irrespective of the difference between Hindu, Muslim, and so on. Uh, and, and there are many places where he makes a very much a point that the, the followers of these groups or these um, masters are actually, they, they come from all different persuasions and they're not actually, uh, um, they cannot be classified as um, Muslim or Hindu, Jain, etc. They're all, um, so there, there is something about the religious world um, that is ecumenically ab available to anyone who wants to engage with it on the question of the inner and the outer. Um, however, the religious forms that get established are based upon an outer form. So how does one actually then uh, manage that, that crossover between inner and outer is what seems to be kind of uh, motivating him. So, um, so with that, then the question becomes about what, how does this actually help us in any way um, to think about Sufis and particularly of this, um, this, this particular uh, situation, historical situation. <clears throat> so I think what, what is happening in this work um, is trying to process a world marked by extreme and vast mutual differences. Um, in which the categories that are being utilized to even classify them um, don't actually hold based upon certain types of challenges that can be, can be made uh, from within them. So the, the, the, the, the problem of knowledge um, and what is true knowledge is constantly in tension with social formations that one can see. And because the social formations and the group formations are um, exceedingly wide, mutually distinguish, distinguishable, and also constantly transforming into new forms, um, how one manages between any sense of um, kind of stable knowledge versus the world that is constantly moving is, is what is underlying the epistemological problem that he, that he is trying to work with here. Um, so it, it brings up fundamental questions about, um, you know, how, is the truth on the outside of the body or the inside of the body? And neither option is actually satisfactory. So one can't just say it's just inside um, because there is this transference is going on between the inside and the outside. Um, <clears throat> so essentially the outside difference has to be appreciated contextually. Uh, if you are doing something that this, that this man Sutrasha is doing, then it's trying to get to some truth. But if you are doing the same thing as the followers of Sutrasha, then you're actually not doing what the master himself did because you're doing it within the context of, a, of an established practice, right? So the, the, the fact that the practice has to change um, seems to be built into uh, a sense of what is um, uh, true knowledge and the world is actually moving. So it's a, it's a highly contingent uh, form of uh, understanding religious knowledge, which is radically opposite to how colonial administrators actually understood um, what was happening religiously in India um, 
And so, because this is being written at the same time as the, the co colonial officials are producing their first surveys of the religions of India, it, it stands in like radical contrast with how religious difference actually is being processed um, within, uh, within this cultural world. Um, now, so then the, the also question, it becomes, is there any kind of stable universal uh, knowledge, religious truth that stands apart from, um, uh, apart from its performance uh, in some way? Um, and there, um, I think he does take the term Sufi to be a positive judgment. To call someone a Sufi is, um, is positive, but a Sufi could be anywhere, could be an Iranian, uh, uh, Zoroastrian could be a Hindu, could be a Muslim, and so on, <clears throat> depending on the uh, the uh, kind of posture that they adopt towards the world. Um, so in that way, Sufism in this context becomes a way to, it's a kind of hermeneutic to manage the world, and it is to manage it socially um, in conjunction with the problem of knowledge as such. Um, so the, he, he's not actually that invested simply in thinking about positing some kind of universal knowledge, which is the true religion. And then, and then saying, well, all these different varieties that we can see um, are just certain forms of it. It's not a bland um, kind of descriptive description of a, of a very vastly di internally different world. The differences themselves are contingent on this universality and keep modifying it. And the social world in which all of this is acting, uh, is happening, um, is, um, is constantly in motion. And Sufism and Sufi thought is a, is a, is a kind of hermeneutic to try to understand this. Um, and it can encompass um, all different forms of religion that one can, one can encounter. I think this is what he, the, the sense I get from what, uh, what is happening in this, uh, in, in this long discussion. Um, and, and so ultimately what I find is that trying to work through this and, and you know, kind of flesh it out more and also correlate with other uh, materials produced in the same period. Um, I think there is, a, uh, there is a story here of the relationship between uh, metaphysics and social existence um, that far exceeds what has become best known to us um, based upon colonial and post-colonial understandings of um, Indian intellectual and social forms. Um, so this is where I feel like um, this attention to this type of material, uh, which actually incorporates certain forms of uh, European knowledge and certainly is able to do it based upon what we can see, can get us to <clears throat> uh, alternative models for thinking about religious difference or lack thereof um, as coming from a very complex religious worlds, uh, religious worlds such as India was and continues to be, but the methods and the frames we have available to think about this academically or even politically at the moment are actually quite impoverished because of the use of uh, certain uh, European philosophical forms for understanding the, the relationship between universal and particular, um, which can be modified changed or put into a dialogue with a, a complex worlds of the type that we see in the work of, um, of Bahadur Singh um, and in this, um, in, um, in, in this, in this Jankari Bahadur. Um, okay, so I will stop with that and hopefully we can go to um, questions and see what you think of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I just uh, would like to uh, remind everyone that you can write your questions in the um, chat uh, function. You can direct them to the um, to the first to the address labeled ask your questions here. <laughs> Um, uh, but I think uh, you can also maybe uh, raise your hand and and and uh, you know voice your question as well. I think we could uh, do either. Um, 
while people are waiting to formulate their questions, shall I just uh, start off by asking some very preliminary uh, questions? Um, I'm hoping I did not miss it, but could you give a little bit of uh, a background on this man? Um, what do we know about him? And, and also, it, it, it, you know, the context in which he wrote this work, uh, the form in which it uh, <laughs> has come down to our time? Was it public, you know, just in general? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. And actually, I didn't say much about this because one, because one of the interesting things is there's very little actually to say. Um, he just gives his name and that mm -hmm. his father's name is Hazari Mal, that he was born in Shah Jahanabad, which is around Delhi, and that he is writing uh, from when he's in Lucknow. We have no other placement of him uh, anywhere that I can, I have at least found at the moment. Um, he's not writing even for a patron, um, at least in the in the work itself. Um, he is um, the there's only one manuscript as far as I know, which is in the British Library, and so this was not published. Um, mm. And it's just this one thing. They, and there's there's some indication there is a library in India that claims to have something, but I'm not sure. But it says it's in a microfilm, so I don't know whether it's a microfilm of this manuscript or there may be another um, copy, but it seems to be, um, yeah, fairly kind of a personal endeavor of some sort. Um, but, the, but what I will say contextually is that there are a number of things like this um, that, that are there, and there's many of them go into thousands of pages. So this mm -hmm. type of activity is not unusual. Uh, in, in the period. Um, and at the time that he is in Lucknow, um, uh, it's very much, the, the state is very much a client of the East India Company. And, and in the histor historical parts of it, he discusses the British residents and the expansion of the company, etc. So he's very well aware of the presence of European power um, inside, of, um, uh, inside of India. And, and, and what's the connection with the company? I mean, who is he writing for, if I may continue? So we don't, is there any we, indication? <laughs> he doesn't say who he's writing for. He basically says he's writing for people who will appreciate what he's doing. Uh, wow. and, and, and there's very there's a very, very small introduction too before he launches into it, um, where he basically praises the question of that in order to live properly, you have to, um, you have, to have experience, tajruba. Um, and therefore, he, he says that um, what he's going to present in these 2000 pages is experience of existence um, in all different forms. And other than that, we have no indication of what he, did someone commission this or, yeah. Um, Thank you. Let me check. So, uh, Tanvir Ahmed, please go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shazad, for for absolutely engrossing talk. Um, my question is about the the way in when when when Bada Singh is writing about okay, the Sutra Shahis are the problem when they begin taking on a particular form, they institutionalize, and this is a pattern throughout all of human history. I guess my question is about when he when he is advocating for folks to break that pattern and try to do something new, does he ask for people or does he give examples of people who are basically trying to go back to older forms and then use older forms to also then break up the new ones? Is there kind of like a historical mixing and matching of the ways in which you de-institutionalize or is, is it basically like a infinite regression in one particular direction where one constantly has to encounter something new and different in order to be transgressive or to be antinomian in a particular way. Does that make sense? Or? 
Yeah, so I think the, um, in a way, part of the thing is that the, the um, what I'm saying about his investment in, in change actually is not something that he explicitly lays out. Um, they, so this is my surmise based upon who he, who he presents positively. So I don't think it's, it's, it's not an infinite regression. Uh, so it's not put into a, um, a kind of a, a temporal frame. It's, it's, a, it's a question, it seems to be a question of attitude uh, that you could keep the external form but change inside uh, or you could change from the outside and then the inside would change or inside would change and outside would change. It seems to be an attunement to um, the, the problem of knowledge as being constructed from the inner and the outer um, and not so much uh, a desired teleology um, of, um, uh, of going one way or the other or going to the past, et cetera. Um, and, and there are, because sometimes the figures from all different traditions, whether they're Muslim or Parsi or, or Hindu or Jain, they're all presented positively if they seem to be involved in, in the questioning and the, the, the, the, the transactions across the boundary. That seems to be the biggest, um, um, biggest investment. Um, and more than that, I, I actually need to um, think more even of, um, because the details are immense to try to see if maybe there's something else going on as well. Thank you very much. Um, Cyril, I don't know whether I'm pr pronouncing your, uh, sorry. Oh, that's totally fine. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Shazad, for the wonderful talk. Uh, Bahadur's use of this term Sufi as a kind of universal or universalizing attitude to negotiating this traffic between the inner and the outer is uh, super interesting. Uh, and it also seems really productive for thinking about religious difference, especially as you said, in our own contemporary moment and work. One thing that jumped out to me though, uh, was a, a kind of structural similarity almost to like perennialist approaches to mysticism in the sense of, you know, for perennialists, we can pick out the specific kind of attitude towards experience and reality that then we can trace through multiple traditions uh, in space and time. And you know, contemporary critiques of these perennialist attitudes have noticed how they kind of implicitly set up one kind of human being from their own social world as the archetype of this like universal form. So I was wondering, does Bahadur, do we get any sense in his work of the particular kinds of beings, perhaps from his own social world or social context that somehow manage this traffic or this attitude between kind of upholding and breaking conventions or realities uh, in ways that set them above their types? And does it map on to religious boundaries and differences the way that we might expect? Or does he kind of uh, like situate uh, and formulate that in a different way? That's a, that's a very good question. And in some ways, actually, I need to um, dwell more in this to, to, to, to fully adjudicate this. But I think the, he's different from perennialists in the sense that the, the, the externals actually matter deeply as well. Uh, so in that way, it's, it's, the, it's the traffic part that seems to be, um, be paramount. So, so therefore, um, someone who looks a certain way and might be more traditional is actually absolutely fine if they're invested in, some, in, the, in the metaphysical part of it or if something is too stable, then changing the external actually reflects more of what is the interior, et cetera. Um, so in that way, it seems, um, I mean, this is where I think that the, the, the, the basic problem that is being discussed is somewhat similar to the perennialist or religious thought in general. But the solution is coming out of social observation of a place like India. Uh, and so there is an investment in managing this world and all, all these immense differences that are available, that, are, uh, that can be seen, but it's not pushing towards a resolution of some sort that they somehow become all the same or even that they are all the same, they're places where it looks like, well, there actually there are fundamental differences between them, et cetera, and that's okay. Sometimes it's not okay. Uh, so it's, and partly it's because of the amounts of material is so much and so extensive, and it is so tied to a kind of 
investment in um, kind of historical sourcing. So it's, it's processing of the phenomenal world um, where there seems to be a significant investment as a historian, um, which then is raising these uh, religious questions. But the religious um, uh, dynamic is not, he doesn't allow it to completely overwhelm the contingencies of history and so on. Uh, so it's a similar, but it's trying to do something else, I think. Uh, and what exactly is, I'm not entirely actually sure yet. But it's intriguing. Thanks. Um, shall I uh, share with you some of the written questions? Sure. Okay. Um, so this is from Zeynep Oktay. Uh, thank you so much for this rich and thought-provoking talk. Uh, would you say that in the examples you gave, such as that of Sutra Shah, the particular and universal stop being opposites, but rather reinforce one another? The more personal and contextual the Sufi thought and practice, the more universal it becomes, question mark. Is personal experience within the moment understood as a universalizing hermeneutic? Yeah, so I think I would and agree with the first part that it is precisely this, um, this kind of privileging of the, of the, of the particular um, and, and the particular action, et cetera, that is, that is working uh, through itself. The, the second part, um, it's, it, it's kind of a suspended judgment on whether there is a right way, there is an ultimate right way or not. Um, so it's not, um, so I, I, would, I don't get the sense that um, it is a particular take on say mystical thought and practice that he's after. Um, it, it's it's it can inferential with respect to what he's able to observe and then open-ended into the future. Um, with a kind of partial judgment hanging somewhere in there that the movement between inner and outer is what will determine what someone's value is or, or isn't. Um, so it's a, so, so I would agree with the formulation uh, that, that then if you had, um, but it's, it's, but there is a resistance to resolution. Um, uh, and there, I think that's where the historical element uh, seems to be significant for him. Sorry, uh, thank you. So uh, shall I read another question? Please. Uh, this is from Akif Yaelolu. Um, thank you uh, very much for this great talk. Can you talk a little bit about the reception of Yadigyare Bahaduri, its other copies? Uh, well, you already said they, there are none, but, uh, but, but there, there is none, but uh, and then he continues. And what other examples of European knowledge uh, was, uh, were there in this work? Um, okay, yeah, that's that's a good question. So there are no other copies as far as I know. Um, the only uh, real reaction to it is there is a work that was published uh, initially in the 19th century and continues to be printed called History of India as Told by Its Own Historians. It's eight volumes that were put together by a man named Sir Henry Elliot, and then he died very early and then another man named Dowson produced it. Now in this, um, in this eight volume set, they had reports on various historical sources that they had collected. So um, this manuscript was in Eliot's collection and there is like a short like 10 page description of this work. Um, and that, that's the only reaction uh, that, that I'm aware of. And, and within that, basically the British scholars when they came across these works, they dismissed them outright as being just repetition from old times. And they would use terms like, um, these are impudent imitators who are doing nothing but plagiarizing, but claiming that they're doing new things. Um, so there is no further processing of uh, what actually is happening uh, in this work. And the only interesting thing that they found in there was that there are parts of um, the coverage of the history of Avad and Dakhna, where he's writing from that are not available in other sources. So that's, that's the only um, uh, reaction that, that I'm aware of. Um, the other European knowledges that are there, um, so in basically in the discussion of, the, of philosophers, um, the, uh, the biggest discussion is of um, uh, kind of astronomy and the change of cosmology. There's also a discussion of um, doctors, um, 
and European medical knowledge that comes up. Um, and then the other one is very extensive discussion of European history um, that comes in the, in the last section in which it goes country by country, you know, England, France, Portugal, Switzerland. Um, there is a discussion of the new world, um, of Columbus, <clears throat> Americas, South America, and all of that. So that obviously is all is coming from uh, European sources that is being um, adapted. By the time he's writing, this is already available in Persian, so he wouldn't actually have to read it in English. This was already absorbed, but he, he puts into this um, new um, new framework that, that, that, that he's devised. Um, uh, there is also some amount of knowledge coming from European Christian sources about Christianity um, that is that one can find here and there where he's talking about um, early Christian patriarchs and so on. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the that's what at least um, um, I have to confess. Uh, you know, it's I haven't gone through the whole two thousand pages with a tooth comb, so there may other be other things as well. Um, but in terms of where I wanted to check to see where, you know, how things have been incorporated, that's what that's what I've found so far. Thank you. Shall I read another question? Sure. I know you have a cold, but <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, I'm just we have the privilege of having you here, you know. Um, so uh, this is a question from Fezanur Kara Aachloolo. Uh, she writes. How do the owners of adherence, adherence to this knowledge slash perception of truth view social problems such as poverty and injustice? Do they conceptualize problems them as problems at all? Do they have their own liberty? These are all in quot qu uh, quotation marks. Do they have their own liberty, equality, fraternity? I mean, would there be a political universal truth they would like to advocate for? I hope I'm not too, of course, uh, but universality reminds me so much of the French Revolution. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. So interesting. Thank you. So, so that's actually a very good question. Um, and what uh, the universality that is there on the quest on those types of questions about liberty, equality, um, economic equality, etc., cetera, um, uh, which comes at the very end of the work after he described political history, which is, political theory coming from mirrors for princes, um, from earlier works, and in which the question of equality, uh, you know, kind of justice, et cetera, basically looms uh, very, very large. So he has long lists of what, um, what rulers should do, how they should behave, um, uh, et cetera. So they, but it's a different type of universality than coming from the ground up. So in terms of the, certainly the, the kind of ideology that comes in the, the French Revolution. It's more of an, um, of an obligation of the rulers type of um, universality um, that, uh, that is present there. So that's one part of it. Now that, um, that uh, tradition of course is deeply uh, imbricated with Sufi ideas um, by the time that he's writing in terms of the types of mirrors of princes that are available in, in, in Persian and in India and, and in other languages as well. <clears throat> So there, the, the, the obligations are to the rulers are often being actually uh, presented by their Sufi counterparts. Um, and so one of the main functions of the Sufi masters is to tell the rulers to behave in certain ways and, and so on. So that's the, uh, that's the axis that is there. In terms of the actual um, uh, small stories of the type that I shared very briefly, there is often, um, a play on uh, that the the the individuals who are disrupting some sort of a situation, they're doing it in order in order to invoke greater justice. So, if, and that some forms that are available, they've actually created the situations of injustice. So, breaking them uh, towards quote unquote some form of some form of an antinomian presence is is invoked there. But that also is a part of the the larger mirrors for princes type of discussion and not so much coming from um, the European side. Um, I have not seen, um, uh, although I actually, this is a good question, I will look more carefully to see whether something from the French Revolution or even the American Revolution actually shows up with respect to a different framing of 
the question of liberty and equality. Um, because certainly they know about these things uh, if, by, by this time. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So um, I'll continue. Uh, this is from uh, Professor Engina Karla. Mm, he writes, thanks for a fascinating talk, Professor Bashir. The period on which you focus is indeed most productive in helping us gain a better historically more realistic view of East-West relations. Karl Polanyi underlines the same point more or less in his classic, The Great Transformation, where he also offers an economic explanation why Europeans were relatively universalistic in this period, circa 1780-1850. Similarly, Albert Hurani Similarly, Albert Hurani draws our attention to the differences between relatively universalistic, inclusive European views of humanity compared to the later colonialist views. He uses the example of Goethe, but you add a very rich and deep analysis of the period, looking forward to reading it. Um, thank you very much. This is, this is very helpful. And, that, and what you're saying is precisely where kind of my instinct has been that um, the, the, there is definitely, as many, many people have pointed out, a much richer world that exists before the period of high imperialism with respect to processing of difference, even in the wake of European discoveries around the world. Um, and, and I find that in working through that material that the arguments are often, you know, where the most processing has been done is of uh, sources of, that are created in Europe or are in direct um, uh, under European ages in various ways. I think partly because of the great significance of things like the French Revolution and, and so on. Um, and the, that genealogy that runs from the Renaissance enlightenment into the, into the French Revolution and then onwards. Um, and what I'm uh, finding is what my greatest investment is precisely to enrich this picture by going to this other massive amount of um, thought that is created, that is part of the same world, even if it's not directly invoking it. And through that, to kind of um, expand that, that area yet further as a matter of both intellectual and social history. So thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, I don't see any other written questions. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to pose a question? So thank you, uh, Shezad, for a wonderful, uh, thought-provoking, most interesting, most original talk. I hope we can host you next time. Uh, so thank you uh, again. Sure. Thank you very much. And yes, I look forward to doing this live, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> one day soon, <laughs> uh, somewhere in the world, ideally Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. Thank you. So uh, thanks to everyone 